Welcome to this episode of Caillou Talks. I am Caillou Ninja, and I am super pumped to get this podcast started. Let's cut to the chase. Today we're going to talk about the art of being of service. That's right, we're going to talk about being of service to something. A person, a group, a community, a cause, or a belief. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, Not everybody can be famous, but everybody can be great, because greatness is determined by service. Wow, greatness is determined by being of service. Just helping others is truly the greatest thing we can ever do to each other as humanity. That's something, right? I did not want to drop names on this, but when I picked this topic up, my mom said that she had a friend that would be a perfect fit to talk about it. And when I learned about her and what she does for a living... She was right. Melvette Hill has spent over 25 years making a positive impact in communities by bringing families together through her work in corporate, government, and nonprofit organizations. Talk about a meaningful living. She was born and raised in Harlem, New York, growing up in a diverse environment that was equally segregated. She was recently appointed Executive Director of Connecticut's Commission on Women, Children, Seniors, Equity, and Opportunity. That is a mouthful, honestly. Melvet had a deep faith in commitment to racial equity, social change, and civic engagement. She lives in Danbury with her husband and is the mother of four young adults and the grandmother of two grandsons. I did not meet their children, but soon in the future, I will. But what I found most interesting about my guest today is how she described herself as a servant leader. I can't wait to know what that is in the show. Melvet, welcome to Kai Talks. It's so great to have you here. First of all, thank you for always supporting me and being a friend to my mom. I think I speak for her when I say that she likes you a lot. Yes, yes. And it's an honor for me to be invited to be on your podcast show. And, um, of course, I love your mother and your family. So thank you. Thank you for having me today. Oh, it's truly an honor. But seriously, I want to be real with you. I just want to say that you've been supporting me ever since I made that speech in in the in the state capitol. And I just want to say it was truly an honor for you. Also, congratulations on being promoted recently to the boss of that. Thank you. Yes, it's it's a big job. And hopefully I can make uh, the state of Connecticut proud as I serve them in that role. Honestly, I think that you'll make a very good part of it. So let's get on to the show. Part one, talk to me. Tell me about your story and please don't leave out all of the hard parts of it. Okay. Um, So I think my story as a servant leader started um, in the church. So I grew up in a Baptist church in New York City, and we served. We served the church. We served the people who came in. We served each other. And in church, it's not a hard thing to do. Um, There's a lot of humility that is instilled in us as people uh, to love one another, uh, to be kind, uh, to be giving, and to serve. I learned actually about servant leadership in a different way when I was working at a large retail organization um, and I had a manager who was a servant leader. And I didn't know what that meant in corporate. I I didn't know what that was in corporate America. Um, I knew what it was to be a servant leader in a church and in, you know, what I consider the kingdom of God, but I didn't know what that meant in the business world. And I had a leader who... Uh, showed us what that was and told us what that was. And pretty much what he said was um, to be a servant leader is to be in service of the people who report to you and the people you're around and to always hope to give them the support uh, that they needed so they could be successful. And so it's not about what people can do for you. It's about what you can do for people. How can I help people to be great? And so I try to live by those values. I saw that um, was done for me in corporate America. And so I try to live by those values every day to be a servant leader in my work. That was amazing. Also, I just want to, I just want to put, I'm just going to dress the elephant in the room. I really love your makeup and earrings. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. I love, I especially love the eyelashes. Thank you. I appreciate it. Because it's the color. Okay. So here's some follow-up questions. How did you experience as a special, how did your experience as a special needs mother inform your work? Did I can prove it? 
It did. So um, I'm always a mother first, and I just happened to have children who um, needed some additional attention and help in school. And a lot of them, um, three out of the four actually had IEPs, which are individualized education plans. And so um, mothers are advocates without even knowing, right? They're always fighting for their children and fighting for what they need in school and fighting what they, you know, for what they need in community to be successful. And so I think that helped inform um, how I showed up in different spaces. Um, I, it informed my work because I was introduced as a, as a special needs mom. I met other moms who had children who needed extra help and attention in school. And they told me about the Parent Leadership Training Institute, which is a family civics initiative that helps parents understand their own personal leadership understand how uh, that relates to their self, their family, and their community. And then it also helps them build this democracy toolkit to understand how local and state government works so that we can be change agents. So if we want change and to make change, we have to understand how systems work. And so being a special needs mom and being an advocate already and then taking that course that was like six months long, helped inform my work today. So back in 2004, if you can believe it, it was that long ago, I took the Parent Leadership Training Institute and I graduated. It is now 2024. And that commission that I work for, the big long name, um, that commission actually is the home of PLTI. And so from being a parent leader and taking that course to now being the person who runs the commission, who's responsible for that curriculum, is pretty big to me. And so it helps me to, uh, you know, encourage other parents uh, that the, the little steps that we take in the beginning can really have a larger impact later. So I think that's how I inform my work, right? My, my involvement in the Parent Leadership Training Institute and now leading that work in the state. And now, first of all, let me, let me apologize for my mother. <laughs> Who has, who didn't spoke, who spoke in the middle of the recording. I'm just, I'm just really excited for Milvet in this point. It's okay, I, I forgive you, I forgive yes. I for, it's I, just, I for, such a huge deal. Let me tell you, but you are so right about mothers being living advocates. Mothers are more, the more mothers are more than that. They are warriors. Yes. They will do anything for their, for their babies, for their babies. They will do anything for them. That's right. They are living warriors and are going to fight to make a difference in their child's life. And that was what I love most about why God made mothers. They are, they are, it's just it's just life-changing. Without my mother, none of this would have happened. She was my main inspiration for this. Yes, you have a phenomenal mom. Round of applause for her. Yes. Who is behind stage. Moving on. How do you incorporate your faith into your work? How do you like import all of your faith, all of your beliefs into your life, work, and passion? Yes. So it's the reason why I wake up every day. The fact that I woke up this morning is an indication that I'm still supposed to be here in this earth. And I do believe that the reason I get to exist every day is because there's work I'm supposed to do. And so I believe that. That's my center. I believe that God created me to do some special things here. I think that God created everyone to have something special within them to solve a problem, to do something special on this planet, just like you and your podcast and all the wonderful things that you're doing. That was part of your purpose. So I believe my work is part of my purpose and I incorporate my faith and my strong belief in God that he has equipped me with everything I need, whether I believe it or not, but he has equipped me with everything I need to be successful and to do this work. So my faith is my center in all that I do. So you're saying that we are the, we are all made for our own purpose and not to just live life. I believe we're all made and created for a special purpose here. Yes. I, that's what I love about this lady. This is what I love about this woman. She, she, she has faith that we all have our own purpose. I believe it. Mom believes it. Everyone believes that we all have a purpose to make here. So everyone in your viewers, listen to this woman. She might give you the words that you need so you may find your own. This woman might be the first inspiration you might have in your life. 
Because that, all, every word that she says is true. It's like so true. It should be in the Bible on this by now. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to say that to you, God, but that should be in the commandments. That uh, the the latest commandment. We should all ha we all are destined to have our own purpose. So thank you for sharing that in our podcast. That is truly amazing because you are the first person to like get this much of an impact mm. on the show. Well, thank so you. thank you for that. And also, this is a this is a big one. Okay. What does being a servant leader mean to you? Because when I when I read, when I read this in the first time at home, I was skimming through my dictionary in my iPad, and it said no logs found in servant leader. I was like, what the heck? So, can you clarify what does servant leader means to you? Yeah, it it means that I am in service to the people. It means that everything I do and how I show up in this world is to make an impact on people. It's not self-serving. It's not how can I be great? Even though I do want to be great, let's not mistake that. Yeah, but, but you already are great. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. You, you already but, have made a very good impact. Yeah. Let's just put that on the floor. Yeah. So I, I think being a servant leader is understanding that I am here to serve other people, that I, I am in service to, number one, as we talked about faith, the things that God has put me here in the earth to do. So my special gifts and talents that I'm putting them to good use, but also in my state work, as the executive director of the Commission on Women, Children, Seniors, Equity, and Opportunity, I serve the people of Connecticut. And I serve the team, the people who work for me, the eight people who are on my team, I serve them. What can I do to help you? What can I do to help you accomplish your goals? What can I do to open a door or to be a buffer when you need help? And so that's to me what a servant leader is. It's constantly being in service to other people. Oh, so you're saying that being a servant leader is being selfless and being a selfless helper. Yes. That's why I follows that amends. But what I found, let me tell you, let me be honest. When I found out servant leader, that reminded me a lot about this vein where God said that he wasn't here to be served. He was here to serve. Yes. And that's why, that's why I love about that word. So yeah. you use a very, you chose a very good thing about that word. Thank you. Moving on to part two. What are the biggest lessons you have learned from the most challenging parts of your life? Please, but as we already told you, don't leave out the most challenging, gruesome parts. Okay, <laughs> I'll try not to. So I think um, when, so I grew up in the 70s, and so now I'm kind of telling a little bit of my age, but I went to a private school, um, a Catholic school, kind of like how you went to. And um, I was very young when I entered that school. Actually, at that time in the 70s, there weren't preschools. There was no, like, you know, programming for three- and four-year-olds. And so I had a sister who was going to a particular Catholic school. My mom at the time was a nurse. My dad was doing other things, and they needed someone to watch me. I was getting to be too big and too bright to be just babysat and, and things like that. I had a bad experience um, at a family daycare where the dog bit me. So they were like, we have to figure something out. So they put me into, they convinced the school to, to bring this three-year-old, I was just almost three, to be in a kindergarten class. And, um, and so I adjusted. And by the time I got to first grade, this is where people maybe started to notice that I was a little different or showed up a little different in spaces. And I did a lot of daydreaming. Uh, a lot, you know, nowadays people might say, oh, that's zoning out, right? People are like, oh, you know, they're zoning out. Uh, we do know now that there's a diagnosis for certain, some of those behaviors that I was exhibiting but wasn't diagnosed back then. I had ADHD. And so I couldn't attend to class. I was constantly daydreaming. I was constantly not in circle time and doing things. And I remember very specifically I was called out. I remember I was, I was actually daydreaming. I remember this. I was in first grade. And we were learning the ED sound, ed. And the teacher probably just was not doing a good job keeping me um, in with her. But I remember her saying, Melvette, how do you pronounce that? What is that word? And I couldn't say. It really was just ED. But I wasn't paying attention. And she made me feel horrible. 
And I remember not wanting to be there anymore. And the kids were laughing at me because really it was just the Ed sound. But I wasn't paying attention. And, and she didn't give me what I needed to be there. And she also made me feel bad. I say that because throughout my early time in school, I always was very self-conscious that I was a little different and I showed up different in spaces. And I would say the biggest challenge is how do you overcome that when people see you differently and you're not like everyone else? And one thing that my mom told me was that it's okay to be you. Of course you're different. You were created to be different and you have unique things about you that no one else has. And so that was one of the challenges that I've continued to have to overcome and not be the person who had to fit in and even where I wanted friends and no one wanted to be my friend. Uh, Overcoming the challenges of being okay with who I am and understand that I'm special and I'm unique and I'm important and that I can do great things. So I would say, if I were to give you a quote, um, I recently was in Louisville, Kentucky And I got to visit the Muhammad Ali Center. And, you know, Muhammad Ali was a great boxer. You know, he had that, you know, term, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Well, what I learned a lot about Muhammad Ali at that King Center was that um, he had this motto that he instilled in his children and people around him. And it was, be great and do great things. And so I think that's how I overcome those challenges of insecurity or how people see me is that, I'm always going to do my best to be great, and I am going to do great things. Um, The other thing is fear that I want to talk about, challenges. Um, There were many a times when I was a a student as well as an adult when I was afraid to do things, right? Afraid of if I do this, what will people think? What will they say? And will I fail? And a lot of that has to do with change I want to see in my community and in my state and change for families. Um, There's a quote from James Baldwin that I love, and he says, nothing can be changed until it is faced. So if we run away from things because we're afraid to do the things, change is never going to happen. We have to face the change. And so I think um, that's important. And I've also learned to never give up, never give up on my dreams, never give up on other people, because sometimes people will disappoint us. And so we have to give them grace. We have to... Give them space to make changes, to course correct, uh, to try to be their best selves. But I never give up on people, and certainly I never give up on myself and the dreams that I think God has put in me. That was amazing. The way that you, like, I didn't even need a quote, but you already gone the extra mile, my friend. And that's what I like about it. Now, follow-up questions. You ready? Okay, I'm ready. What advice would you give to 12-year-old Melvet. So similar to some of the stuff I've said just now, I think I would tell 12-year-old Melvet. So 12-year-old Melvet was actually in middle school, and 12-year-old Melvet was was battling um, that whole dynamic of trying to be in the in crowd, right? What can I do so that people will like me? And middle school is hard. Um, I know this because I had four children who all went through middle school. And so I saw it in my own life and I saw it in their lives. And it's a space where you're you're not in elementary yeah. anymore um, and please. you're not quite in high school. And you're in that weird in, be- in between space. We call it a liminal space, right? You feel like you're in limbo and you don't know who you are and you don't know how you're feeling because you have all these hormones now that are kind of raging and you're growing and sometimes your voice is changing. And you're trying to discover who you are in spaces. And I would say to the 12-year-old Melvet, be you, be yourself. Don't try to be like your friends. Don't try to be like other people. But the you that is emerging and that is taking place and that is growing and flourishing, be that person, right? So if you happen to be super tall, I was really tall. They started calling me an Amazon. I actually liked it, Um, but they thought it was like a, a bad joke. I was very tall for my age. And I embrace that because guess what? Tall girls play really good volleyball and basketball. And so that's, that's my, what I did. That's my friend Kendra used to do. She <laughs> yeah. used to volleyball. Yeah, right? Yeah. So I would tell my 12-year-old self to, to just be okay being you. It's going to be okay. Perfrey, how do you make an impact? I use my position in many cases to make an impact. So sometimes I like to call it opening doors. 
A lot of my work is about access and opportunity, ensuring that people who don't have a voice have space to have a voice or people who don't have an opportunity. For example, like you were able to speak at the Capitol, right? Well, how did you get there? Someone invited you. Sometimes I'm the person who invites other people. Hey, could you come be a speaker here? Or is there something that you have to say? Yesterday, I was with some students um, from the Asian American Pacific Islander community, and we had an event, and they were on a panel. And afterward, I said to them, let me know how else I can be of service to you. How can I help you to have your voices heard? Are there other things you want to do? And so I think by me offering myself as um, a resource and as someone who can maybe open a door or give them um, space and place to do something has an impact on on how people are being seen and heard and what they can do. Top notch there, top notch. You have worked in many ways to support parents and children to, and uplift voices. Please tell us about your new position and what you hope to accomplish. Well, in my, in my new role, I want to continue the work that's been started with the commission. So um, years ago, we used to have six commissions and it was two and now there's one. And so there was a lot of work to be done in kind of reshuffling the deck and, and understanding what the mission of the commission would be. It still sits that we all believe and understand that the, the number one you know, role is that access and equitable opportunity to engage in systems change and to make sure that people's voices are heard. I think the other role really is helping legislators and policymakers in the state to hear the voice of people. So nothing without us, you know, nothing for us without us, right? So if you're making policies about me and my community, we want to have a voice in it. We want to have an opportunity to share in it. Um, and, and then also elevating issues that are concerning families. So things that are happening in community, things that are affecting everyday people, maybe not so good things, we need to ensure, and my job is to ensure that legislators legislators and people in the executive branch, like the governor and all the people who lead agencies, understand what's happening and so that they can make policies that help people live better and really thrive in Connecticut because we want people to stay here in Connecticut. That is amazing. Welcome to the Mean Bean Challenge. To everyone who has just logged in right now, we're going to do a mean bean challenge. So some of these beans might be super tasty, but don't be fooled. Some of these beans might have some gross flavors. And <sighs> today, we're going to have our guest today, Melvet, to do it. Now, this here's the cup of shame. If you drink the cup of shame, you lose the challenge. And to this day, I have never been defeated. But can this all change? Let's find out. Go ahead, Belvet. Challengers first. Okay, so do I you have it? to twist. You have to lift it. Oh. And then place. And then oh, and do it. I see. No, no, no! Don't no! You just gotta right, lower, lower it. it just lower it. Oh. And it selects one. Use choose the brown one. You choose no, the no, no. Choose the, the, the brown one. The brown one. Okay, I'm gonna go. Go for it. It's marshmallow or a snake bug. What was it? No. Does it taste horrible? I don't think so. What does it taste like? Describe it. it tastes like something green. Stink bug. You got stink bug. Mm. Oh, you can tell by that uh, that's odor. Yeah, you got stink bug. Oh, you can tell by the odor? My yeah. bad. Yeah. <laughs> Dirty dishwater, my favorite. All right, well, okay, you're up. Again. Let's do it no, again. No, I'm, you're up. Oh my gosh, the stink bug smell, guys. <sighs> Smells delicious. <laughs> Might be strawberry? I don't know. Bananas and strawberry smoothie. Maybe that's it. Okay, I think um, we're going to match. The Lord has blessed me with birthday cake. Oh. <laughs> the Lord has blessed you with birthday cake. Okay. All right. Last well, one. Let's do this. Ooh. I'm going to go for the red. Ooh. It's pomegranate. Or, or, or that leaves me with dirty the hard one. It's a dirty band-aid. Uh -huh. 
Oh, yeah. What'd you get, Patty? Stink bug. Why did I like a dirty band aid? We're going to question everything you just said in the episode. <laughs> Something's not right with me. Okay. I think you've met your match. It's a draw. None it's of us draw. has. None of us drink the water. And none of us puked. Yes. So, hey, shake hands. To this day, I've never been defeated. Yes. Yes. It was worth it. There it was you worth go. That. Yay. And there you have it, folks. What an enlightening and inspiring conversation we just had with Melvette Hill. Her journey from growing up in Harlem to becoming a dedicated servant leader in her community is truly remarkable. I'm seriously lost out of words. Melvette's commitment to incorporating her faith into her work and her passion for creating positive change are things we can all learn from her as humanity. As Martin Luther King Jr. once said, Greatness is determined by service. Melvet embodies that idea wholeheartedly, using her experiences and beliefs, making a lasting impact on those around her. And I am, again, lost for words about that. That is just amazing. Her dedication to, uplift, to un- uplifting voices and advocating for equity and opportunity is truly commendable to anyone. Thank you, Melvet, for sharing your story and insights with us today. Your words have truly resonated with us and all of our viewers. And we look forward to seeing your continued impact in your leadership in the future. And to all of you great listeners out there, remember that greatness is within reach to all of you guys. When we choose to be of service to others. Don't forget to go to the Caillou Talks website and buy yourself some cool merch. See you next time.